Hi everyone, I'm Shelley Palmer, tech consultant and professor of advanced media in residence at the Newhouse School of Public Communications. I am thrilled to be your host for this preview of the Intelligent Content Zone at the NAB Show 2023. We're bringing together senior business leaders from some of the most influential and innovative exhibitors, including Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Veritone, IMAX SimWave, Nomad, Castus, Arc XP, and more. Together, we're going to discuss next generation technology, best in breed products, and explore the power of intelligent content. So let's dive right in. I am so excited to be here with Tracy Geist, Global Head of Media and Entertainment, Games and Sports Marketing at Amazon Web Services. Tracy, great to see you. Nice, Shelley. Nice to see you. So, NAB is coming up. And we are really excited about NAB, and we know that AWS is going to have a giant presence there. And I'm just wondering, what are you guys thinking about and how are you approaching the show? Well, we are thrilled to be at NAB once again. As you well know, uh, this is many years that we've been doing NAB. Um, and so once again, it's nice to be there. It's nice to be back in person. Um, we expect a, a great attendance this year, uh, even more so than, than last year. So we're excited about that. You know, the business has evolved so dramatically over the last three years. And I know glass to glass makes all the sense in the world, but there's so many different kinds of glass to glass experiences. What are you seeing as a trend? And, and I mean, you guys are sitting right in the middle of it. Well, I, I think we see, we see, well, I'll say three to four things, right? So on the production of content, we see content production in the cloud. Um, as many people as can can move cost effectively to producing in the cloud, that is um, that's a that's a key benefit. So even looking across the ability to use people that are located all over the world as you go and create content. So optimally using your resources in the cloud to produce content, we're definitely seeing that as a trend and studios doing that. Um, another big trend we are seeing is live remote production. So live remote production for, for, for sports, for news, for uh, broadcast, um, we, we definitely see a significant movement in, in that area and are really excited about uh, the services and the partners the partnerships that we have bring to bear there. Um, I think the third thing is um, a focus on monetization. And you know, we look at monetization from the standpoint of everything from subscriber acquisition to retention and um, and monetization. So all the way from the early acquisition of subscriber through to things like um, advertising models and and monetization models for for our content customers. So those are the the three big three pillars. Um, I, th I think the other thing that um, kind of circles around all of that is um, the the integration of those workflows together. So different departments across our media customers coming together to make to ensure that their workflow across. Um, their their load across the workflows is optimized in cloud creation and cl cloud delivery. Now, I think everybody knows that AWS has the most comprehensive suite of products. Sure. I'm not shilling for Amazon. I think Jeff Bezos is doing just fine. But if you look at the products and services AWS has, it's robust. The question is too robust uh, from a consumer perspective. And depending on what your use cases are, it's hard to understand where the abstraction layer is that you're supposed to enter the AWS production universe. Can you talk a little bit about how the various kinds of producers should look at AWS and, and what, what is the best way to find your, to seek your level inside that vast organization? Absolutely. It's such a great question because we um, one of the things that we've done in structuring our business focused on media entertainment is really taking a hard look at not just enabling builders at the at the low end, so people who need component parts and want to build their own solutions, but really focusing on the solution part um, at the high end. So different workloads have different solution area focus. So we have split, you know, organized our business into five buckets. Um, so content production, broadcast, media supply chain and archive, data science analytics, and direct to consumer. So we have specific solutions, built purpose-built solutions for those areas of workloads that enable our customers to come in and identify their workload need and their problem and start with a solution that is 
uh, purpose-built services from AWS, integration with partners um, to round out that solution, and then the packaging and delivering through it with services um, in support of that. So really taking it at all the different layers of engagement. So if you want, if you're a builder, you have a layer of engagement. If you're a buyer of solutions, you have a layer of engagement. If you're somewhere in between, you have the ability to kind of pick and choose your model based on those key workloads that our customers have talked to us about. Tracy, in the in the old days, AWS was a problem, not a solution, because you needed to know how to use it. You literally had to employ engineers who needed to employ engineers, who needed consultants to get into it. And now it is a different world. Can we just talk about that for a second? Absolutely. So th this is exactly why we have... Um, creative focus on industry at AWS and media entertainment as an industry focus is key. But by focusing on industry, um, you you bring forward expertise within that industry and you bring forward the ability to deliver solutions that are aligned to the needs of those, those customers rather than have them have to pick up component parts and build the solutions themselves. So we're very focused on up-leveling that so that our customers don't need a deep level of expertise in all of the individual components, but they can come and engage at a solution level with ourselves and our customers and our partners to deliver to that need. I'm excited to put Shelly TV on AWS immediately. Tracy, th <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Shelly. My pleasure to be here. Look forward to seeing you at NAB. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris Gordon, who's a principal program manager on Microsoft's worldwide media and entertainment industry team. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hey, Shelly. Nice to see you. It's nice to be seen. So NAB is coming up. Microsoft's going to have a huge presence. What are you looking forward to? We're looking forward to a lot. Uh, Microsoft has been building a lot of momentum in media and entertainment over the last several years. And we've got now some really, really interesting things to show for it. Um, I would say that at, at, a, at a very high level, we see there is a massive opportunity in front of media broadcasters and publishers to just engage differently with audiences in a more meaningful way and in a way that that provides value both to the user as well as to the publisher. And so we're gonna have a, a bunch of things on display to, to highlight that. From a workflow and process perspective, NAB is, is a tech show and it's yeah. a show about getting production done. Can you talk to me just a little bit about the way Microsoft is viewing workflow and process going forward in the from a production perspective? Yeah, so the way that Microsoft is viewing workflow and production uh, is, is, is broad. Certainly, tools like AI play a role in how we're approaching that um, set of solutions, but it's not the only tool in the bag. There's a there's a deep and rich set of capabilities that Microsoft has been investing in for decades um, that that bring value to um, media publishers and, and operators. And this has to do with interactivity. It has to do with the media supply chain, how you move content in and out of a cloud. Uh, in a way that's um, you know secure and reliable and and globally scalable. So I would just say that AI is an important piece of what we're looking at now, and obviously what we're thinking about going forward. But it's by no means the only the only trick in the bag. So there are maybe more than ever two constituencies coming to NAB: the established broadcasters and the normal, the usual suspects, if you will, people who are in the industrial business of production. But almost everybody's a media company now, and certainly every company is a media company now. Uh, we, we just take a view that the opportunity is much larger than what you would normally consider to be kind of marquee media you know, businesses. They certainly have an ongoing and very important role to play. But we see that there is a a very interesting and potentially obvious, but obvious from a gaming lens, but not so obvious from the media lens, is that there is a very interesting opportunity to leverage some of the tools from gaming to drive for engagement. And I'm talking about just the massive power of fun uh, when you engage with something and the massive power of fun with friends, of doing that with community. And so the way that we think about it is if you can, if, if media companies in any company that is using media to distribute, if they can tap into that power to create experiences that are fun, fun to interact with, but also connected to their community, there's a wide blue ocean of opportunity out there. Think about the, think about the, the 
journey that game publishers have been on over the last 10 years. They started off as products that you would buy and then transitioned into services to which you would subscribe. But increasingly, the most popular and the most successful games are those that present a community to which you belong. And you, if you are a gamer or you know a gamer or you know uh, you have one in the family, maybe your kid's a gamer, what you will see is that what keeps people coming back to those experiences is not just that the experience is fun. It's not just that the content is good, but I come back to, to be with my friends and to experience that with them. And so whether that's Fortnite or Roblox or Minecraft, those are largely community centric experiences. And what we see is an opportunity to bring that same type of value to media publishers. But to do that, you need things like payment rails and you need tools. So what, where are we in that evolutionary scale from the tools being readily available acro across that whole range of, of users? Yeah, well, I would say that there's traditional gaming tools and those are absolutely available and ready to use um, by, by businesses that are outside of gaming. And we and that's one of the things that we're leaning on is some investments that we've made some years back to build out a suite of services that support our Xbox clients, but also are um, generic enough that they can be applied outside of gaming. And media is one of those very, very well aligned use cases to gaming. Um, but if you just think about another example like sports, Sports and sports broadcasting, and even you know music and movies and TV, they come with such powerful community. And that community, you know, it used to be formed in like the break room around the water cooler, or at you know most dinner parties that you've been to, where people are sharing what they're watching and where they're getting it and all that kind of thing. Um, but that community is now also forming on digital platforms. And so, um, it, you know, having the ability to not just create all of that value associated with the content and with people's engagement with it, but also to provide a platform for people to connect with one another and then to and then to have visibility into those conversations into that into the value that it's bringing there that we see is is the avenue for for media publishers to get upside. What are you looking forward to at NAB this year personally? Uh, we've been talking and building a lot of these underlying capabilities for a while. And you asked about like, what else was like, what else was possible? And, and I mentioned the gaming tools. The other thing that's really, really fun now is that a lot of the very high quality kind of broadcast production grade, you know, equipment and solutions and capabilities that, that programmers and broadcasters have relied on for a long time, that those things are now newly available as cloud native services. And that just unlocks opportunity because I no longer have to you know build buildings and and create all these physical spaces I can I can rent a production capability by the hour as opposed to building it and capitalizing it and that's only possible in a like just just recently and so what I'm looking forward to is saying hey listen we're telling the the market at large a story about hey listen you can spin up these very production grade use cases uh, you can use engagement tech to monetize them further and open up a world of, of events and uh, media production capabilities that wasn't available to you before. And at this NAB, we're plugging all of that together in a live infrastructure and showing people in real time that that's possible, that you can build, produce, deploy, engage, distribute uh, very fun, very engaging events, uh, and then shut it all down when you're finished with it. Movie mogul as a service. I like it. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll give you the trademark. <laughs> Fantastic. Chris, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Nice to see you, Shelly. Thank you for the time. Is this my real voice? Let's find out. I'm here with Ashley Bailey, Director of Product Marketing, AI Voice, and Emerging Synthetic Technologies at Veritone. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? You know what? Better than I deserve. Here's the question. The number one coolest thing that is happening anywhere in the universe is synthetic generative media. And the part of that that's really as far along as anyone can imagine it being is voice synthesis. And you are sitting smack in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. Yeah. Voice cloning. I mean, we've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it's definitely a very exciting part of our business. Uh, we do custom voice clones and we also have uh, premium voice clones. We actually work with um, about, you know, over 70 different voice artists and have voice models 
uh, of, of them for the voice artists who wish to monetize their AI voice as well. Um, but yeah, custom voices for, you know, um, advertisers to, to use with the talent that they're working with, you know, TV and film, broadcast, radio, podcasting. It's really exciting. Obvious question. How do you clone a voice? How do you clone a voice? So um, you need training data uh, to train the model. So that's first things first. So once we get, um, actually, I'm going to back up. It starts with consent. So that's something that um, we feel very passionate and strong about is getting the consent of the individual first. Uh, once we have consent, then we go down the path of training the voice model. So um, getting you know upwards of uh, three hours of training data, high fidelity training data. Um, it's a it's an, uh, an overused statement in AI, but garbage in, garbage out. So we get the best quality quality data um, that we can from that specific talent. And we can use pre, um, uh, pre-existing recordings as well, especially like if they are a podcaster and there's, you know, or a broadcaster and there's a lot of content that already exists so that they don't have to go into a studio and record. Once we have all that training data, um, then it's, you know, just a process of uh, fine tuning the voice model. And once that's done, um, then it's, you know, putting in, putting in the, the text and then the output is in their voice. And we actually offer both text to speech and speech to speech. Um, so it actually could be a speech input as well. In other words, for those who aren't understanding speech to speech, you'd have a voice actor who is not the talent read precisely the words in, with the inflection you're looking for, and then you will map the cloned voice over that. That's exactly right. Yeah, we've been um, referring to the the voice talent coming in as a voice double, you know, and, you know, in film, we always know of a stunt double. Um, and so we've been calling them a voice double um, in that instance. And that's exactly right. They go in and they, um, it's, they, they mimic that, you know, person. And so that it's coming out with um, that inflection and the way that that uh, celebrity or talent speaks um, in their voice. And we can also do it in multiple languages. So it can be their unique voice, in French or Spanish or Italian or um, whatever other language. So this is the question that I think everybody's asking as a content creator. Yeah, sometimes I have to coax my talent, but every, most of the time, if I have great talent, they're doing stuff I could not have imagined. Where does this technology fit in that range? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a few things there. Um, well, on the voice artist side, I mean, we... Like I said, we partner really closely with the voiceover community, um, and we believe in the art of that. And the the thing with doing what we call premium voices with the voiceover artists and then custom voices is it's their voice. You know, it's their IP. It's the way that they speak. That voice model was built for them, and and so the output will be the uniqueness of that voice, and the creativity lies. Um, in the lines and the text uh, that's being written. Um, and any adjustments can can be made on the back end to, you know, maybe raise an inflection and an inflection or something like that if the if the output didn't come out uh, quite right. Just on the editing side, you know, take a take a scene where they're out there and it's windy and you know something happens to the audio, take a show like uh, Yellowstone or something like that. Um, then post-production editors can actually, uh, fix the, those scenes um, or, you know, even uh, do some additional voiceover that wasn't there to begin with without having to pull the actors back into the studio. In that case, uh, the voice double is actually the actor. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of magic. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So there's there's definitely a lot that can be done on that side as well. How How does that work in a production and how will you know you have an authentic Morgan Freeman, I'm making this up. How will you know it's the authentic Morgan Freeman model that you're using? So yeah, we have inaudible watermarks on um, all the voice models that we create. And so what we can check for is if it was a veritone, you know, created voice model. So if it was Morgan Freeman, for example, and his his manager said, hey, we, we heard this advertisement. I don't know where it came from or anything like that. And we got a hold of that audio file. We could tell if it was created from, from Veritone or not. It's a brave new world. It's going to come with a lot of opportunities and it's going to come with an equal number of challenges. Ashley Bailey from Veritone. Thanks so much for being here today. 
Thank you. It's nice to be here. SimWave is now part of IMAX, and we're going to learn all about it from Saj Jamal, VP Marketing at IMAX SimWave. Saj, great to have you with us. That's great to be here. Thank you. So I am fascinated by the, the quality experience that SimWave is offering. And from my perspective, just super high quality never goes out of style. But where are you guys, now that you're an IMAX company, where are you guys sitting in the, in the quality value chain? I think the, the big thing is we're champions of quality, obviously curation of great content, joy, fandom, storytelling, innovation, just immersive experiences. The whole idea of just making sure that, you know, you deliver what the fans want and what the filmmakers intend, good things are going to happen. I think one of the things I'm most impressed by is the high level of respect that all of the product, uh, the SimWave products have for the viewer. It seems like you guys have put the viewer in a very special place. That's exactly it. I mean, everything is on the core of our Emmy Award winning um, viewer experience technology. It basically, it replicates a human viewer. And so by doing that, we can push the boundaries of innovation so that we can make sure the truest um, thing that the filmmaker intended gets to what the fans deserve. That's ultimately the goal. That's the driver of all the technology. So I've heard this before, this idea of that the technology mimics the way human would, would view content. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, our super smart scientists, you know, I can't speak to the, the detail of it, but basically they map the human visual system, how, how we actually see. So it's vision science and neuroscience. And by doing that, we're continuously checking against what a human would say. So we're always measuring against actual people. And so by doing that, it's correlating higher than 95% on what an actual human being would say. So we use that at scale because there's obviously, you know, in the world of everything in the cloud, you know, a lot is happening. So how do you know if that video got through the right way? Well, that's a good question. How do you know that video ended up in the player the way that the content creator intended it? Well, so think of our, our software as like a, an army of virtual human quality control testers. They're basically everywhere all the time watching the video. And so they can do that at scale. And if they see something wrong, if there's a banding issue or HDR tone mapping isn't working quite right, we can see it. And when we see it, we can fix it. When you think about immersive experiences, how does SimWave view that? It's such a broad term. Right. I think the, the key thing is, you know, being part of IMAX now, everybody knows the immersive experience of an IMAX theater. Well, now we're moving into the home. And so, again, we're looking at best-in-class devices. We're talking about the big screens with the high brightness levels. And so making sure that we can take that, that film that was in the theater, but it lives on at home. So it's about doing it at the, at the top level and making sure that it, it happens at home. When you think about the future of video delivery, what would you want people to know? Yeah, I think the, the main idea is when, when filmmakers are making their films, you know, it's an art, it's a craft, and they have all the tools available to, to do the best they can with it. But the reality of getting it from there to a screen is very, very difficult. And what the, the takeaway is, we're here to help them. And, you know, my background today is the, the friends scene. So I would say, you know, we're friends of filmmakers and we're friends of fans. And we want to be that smart friend that the industry, the streaming platforms can rely on so that we can help get that content that's delivered in the best way possible. If you were going to help someone new to the business think about steps they should take from a workflow perspective, what, what advice could you offer them? From workflow, I think it's, it's being, being able to trace the degradation or deviation that happens. When you have to take something apart and put it back together again, a lot can go wrong. So if you can't trace it and you can't see it, I think that's step one, knowing how to do that, then you can actually fix it. And I guess another way of saying it is if you can measure it, you can fix it. Saj, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate you being here. No problem. Thanks, Shelly. Thanks for having me. We are having such a great time talking about NAB. I am with Bronco Lapan, who is the CIO of Nomad. Bronco, how you doing? I'm, I'm incredibly excited. This is this is a phenomenal opportunity, so I'm really well. So tell me about NAB and Nomad. So Nomad is a content and asset management platform that is cloud-based. We heavily leverage AI services, advanced capabilities of, of AWS that allow and enable customers to easily manage, discover, and more so empower their content libraries. NAB is all about innovation, and we are living in exponentially innovative times. What are you seeing from trend perspectives that are changing the industry in ways that either you expected or didn't expect? There's two ways to look at that question. One is the user experience. 
we've been stuck in an old paradigm of the users are passively receiving the information that is broadcast to them, the old cable broadcast uh, paradigm. We're switching gears completely, and it's more of a lean forward experience where now users are taking control of what they want to experience. There are fundamental concepts of dynamic channel assembly, meaning I, as a user, can then set, set up exactly what I want to see in my channel. And that is being driven because of the fundamental technologies like AIML, discovering additional information that's hidden within that video. Rather than having an army of people categorize, tag information, we're now providing that metadata automatically and then allowing the user to lean forward and grab control of what they want to see. Everything from a multi-panel view, switching angles on a stage, instead of having only one locked in stage presence for live streaming, which we also manage, or a video recording that's on the side, I now have the luxury as an end user to truly take control of my user experience. And that is a fundamental shift that we're seeing already in play, but it's not yet completely adopted as a common marketplace. Now, on the other side, and that's the customer's perspective, the owner, the owner of the content is now being finally empowered with the necessary tools to manage their content libraries. It's not just a static set of videos or a static set of live channels. You're now adding additional information by using these technologies, as I keep on mentioning AI and ML or additional cloud-based services and allowing the customer, the true owner of the video content to make decisions quickly. With Rather than having 30 days of analytics, you now within a minute can understand trends, can understand how that then ties in together, providing a much richer content experience for the users. And finally, the key, monetizing your assets. That's where the fundamental breakdown has happened, where we are not able to quickly monetize on the asset library that we have in our possession. Ownership, empowerment, monetization. Those are really the key drivers that we're, we will be talking about at NAB. NAB traditionally has been a show about broadcasting and more recently about streaming because streaming is, you know, the more recent technology. I think it's fair to say that every person is now a media company. It's not just every company is a media company. Everybody's a media company. With that in mind, what's the right size organization to come and interface with a nomad? Am I too small? Am I too big? Like where, what's the Goldilocks zone for nomad integration? Much like the other CMSs that we talked about before, nomad does not care. We're serverless, so you don't have to have an initial commitment to then purchase Nomad. You can be a small media company and be up and running within a, a, a day or two. You can be a, a very large corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation, and still take advantage of the same fundamental technology opportunities that Nomad provides. I'm analyzing my own library, hypothetically. How do I know if I've got video that's going to benefit from all of this technology. My normal strategy has been YouTube or Vimeo or some other right. distribution platform that's free. And I might make a little money or I might not, kind of doesn't matter. Mostly it's promotional video. How would I go about analyzing whether or not this is a good idea? So Vimeo and YouTube, the base model there is you hand over the ownership to them and they, they maybe share a little bit of the ad revenue. But what we're trying to promote, and because of the cost structure of Nomad and AWS, if you have a very small library, you turn on certain services, as an example, transcription, you now see what is actually within your recording. You could be a church organization, you could be a venue company that does live events. Instead of having an army of people understand what those videos are, maybe hand it over to, over to YouTube and have them do their technology, take back ownership analyze it using the tools that we provide just naturally within the Nomad platform and see what you want to then broadcast out to your common user base. I don't know if I could have said any of this any better, Bronco Lapon from Nomad CIO. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And we're really excited about NAB. I'm here with the awesome Nathan Bosler, president and co-founder at the equally awesome Castus. Nathan, how are you today? I am wonderful. I'm feeling awesome. So tell me how you see this show coming together and what are you excited about? Well, I think I'm most excited about because we have a lot of momentum. I think it's going to be a huge turnout. I think it's going to be one of the biggest years we've seen yet. And people are there to shop, buy, get demos and see what's latest and greatest in the market of tech. And that's what we're there for. This is a year of AI. It is a year of Web3. It's a year of a lot of hype, but also there's a lot of substance here. What are you most looking forward to? 
Well, you named it, all those things and more. You know, with the big deal coming around with AI and how it's being used, uh, we're looking at being spliced into using with ca uh, captioning, live captioning, real-time captioning, more accurate, more efficient for our customers, using cloud-based tools to do traditionally was done on-prem, uh, but most of all, everything being just linked and connected so that platforms interact so that our users and the people visiting can scale their businesses easiest and most efficiently. And so being at the cutting edge for those broadcast tools, utilizing all these latest and greatest code, uh, the sky's the limit. So workflow and process is probably to some people very boring, but to those of us in production, it's the difference between getting home at night and not getting home at night. And it's also the difference between a really good production margin and maybe not a great production margin. What are the best improvements or the improvements you're excited about? As far as workflow and production, uh, a lot of stuff to streamline and automate. At Castus, we have a little quick uh, fun saying that content is king, but automation is queen. Uh, automating workflows, your single tasks that you used to stack up to you know, publish content, whether it's multiple platforms, whether you're having to go back once your content is ready and then do all these last minute post-production steps like captioning, getting all the sidecar files prepared, all this stuff that would mandate your workflow. Now it can just all be streamlined where you upload shows, you create new streams, and all this sort of stuff happens on the fly. Distribution, creation of, uh, of uh, captions and other sort of things. And um, all this is just happening at your fingertips without wasting time. There's been an awful lot of internal training for very specific parts of the workflow and process across all of video production. And now these tools seem to be democratizing the way that the work can be done. You know, I started video production as my primary focus back in 2002. Uh, that was my passion. That was what I loved doing. And I think the first rule of the, one of the things I learned was it's never going to stop changing. It's never going to stop. Uh, new tools are never going to stop coming about. It's all about innovation and innovation means driving creativity, creating new effects, creating new procedures and workflows, inventing new platforms. So, I mean, it's just a nonstop changing atmosphere in the business uh, of broadcasts. And that's why I think it's so exciting for us uh, at NAB is because that's kind of a vision as a whole as well. So they, they match up and merge perfectly together, bringing cutting edge technologies um, and it's never changing, but that's why we all do what we do. And we love what we do because uh, there's always new stuff to work on and strategize and how can it be perfected? How can it be streamlined? How can it be improved? What values can we add to our existing workflows to improve our business model as a whole? So that's what excites me the most about everything. Nathan Bossler, president of Castus. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Look forward to seeing you at NAB. I am here with Josh Fosberg, who's the CRO of ARC XP. We are so excited to have you. How are you, Josh? Oh, good. Good. Great, Shelly. How are you? Um, I'm great. And I am thinking about NAB, and I know you're thinking about NAB also. What are you guys looking forward to? It's, it's such a fun event. I mean, we're looking forward to being one in person again. I'm sure I'm not the first person who has said that. It's going to be fun to be back in person. What What are the trends that have emerged over the last couple of years, the business has changed so much. What are you, what are you seeing? We, we think a lot about efficiencies in our side. We think a lot about um, this mature space that has been um, continuously growing and how they can get the most out of their, um, out of their legacy businesses, out of the businesses that they're trying to transform into digital businesses and how that all comes together. We know that every company is starting to behave like a media company but there are a ton of legacy systems in place. And so the question I have is, what are the best practices? Today, um, there are a lot of organizations that are working with um, custom platforms, custom things built in-house. They have legacy media asset management platforms, and there are big investments that they've made in these things. Not to mention all of the legacy broadcasting stuff that they've been doing for the last 15, 20, 30 years. So how do you bring that together? How do you bring it from, um, not the old way, because we're still doing it the old way in a way, um, but to a digital transform, digitally transformed way? Um, our perspective is uh, find tools that integrate really well with, another, with one another. Um, find platforms that think about the people that you have on the team as well. 
Um, how do you influence not only the workflows that people are um, uh, conducting to do their day job, in addition to the technology? Um, if you think about those two things, you can move forward in this digital transformation. We're coming off a time where everybody's got some kind of video structure, some kind of infrastructure, some kind of strategy in place. But with the new tools that are available, especially now, um, your organization is going to need to look different and you're going to have to interface differently with the cloud infrastructure. So I think that if you're starting from that point and you're looking to extend yourself uh, even further into this new digital world and, and um whatever that may be in five years is probably different than the way it is today. Um, the things that I think about are, uh, are you investing in platforms that allow for flexibility today and in the future? Obviously, Josh, there's a giant trend towards multi-platform distribution. Yeah, we're seeing it. We're seeing it today. Um, OTT, web, mobile, it all matters. Uh, the desire that we see our clients have is how can our platform help us go to those places today and whatever the, wherever the future leads. Josh Fosberg, who is the CRO of ARC XP. I cannot thank you enough for being here. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I'm so thrilled to introduce Srini K.A., who is the CRO and co-founder of Amagi. Srini, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So, NAB is coming up, and we're all really excited about it. What are you excited about at NAB? A lot of things, actually. Uh, again, it's been it's just the second year after the pandemic where you're going to be together. A lot of things have happened. Obviously, the big news over the last few months have been the generative AI and what would that mean for the industry. So super interested, you know, uh, to see some of the biggest innovations. We'll be talking about some of those, but, you know, overall, I'm super excited about what it can bring to the industry. I'm also excited about uh, uh, you know some of the the big changes that have been happening over the last year. That's kind of uh, you know culminating, if you will, into this whole uh, new television, fast, free ad supported streaming TV. And we're going to be doing a lot of lot of uh, meetings around fast. I know at NAB there is also a full session on the main stage. So that's another very interesting stuff that I'm excited about. It's interesting how quickly we're going back to where we started, free, adver free advertiser supported television is television over the public internet, but you need special tools. And it also comes with a wealth of data. And I know you guys are really, really into that. Let's talk a little bit about how fast is different and also uh, how the value chain sets up. Absolutely. Fast is the, I mean, what I call it, the uh, uh, cure point, right? Earlier, we had this free ad-supported broadcast, what I call Fat TV. Now we're moving to Fast TV, free ad-supported streaming TV. But ultimately, it is about providing an experience to the end user where the discovery becomes easier. You can have a lean back experience. You're not spending 15, 20 minutes trying to figure out what you want to watch. It's a curated experience provided by experts that are actually programming the channel for you. Uh, but the benefit of something like a Fast, even though it's, uh, if you can call it old wine and new bottle, uh, is that you get tons of data. So you get real-time data. You're not talking about statistically extrapolated data, but you know real-time user data for you to program better. You can personalize the channel. And we are going to be showcasing some of the stuff about hey, how do you create a much more personalized uh, television experience. Uh, you can do some interactivity on that. Uh, you can do some really nice innovations. Uh, and much more importantly, given just the reach of FAST, 200 million plus television sets today that FAST is available on, you get access to tons and tons of new audience that otherwise you not have access on your own app or on even traditional broadcast. So, so that's super exciting. When I think about the audience, and that's what you have to think about first, they do have um, expectations about their experiences. So in, if you're new to FAST and you're new to data-driven programming, there's an awful lot to learn. What should programmers be thinking about as they are thinking about moving from more traditional tools or even kind of bland streaming without a lot of thought behind it, just the tool not rather than the data-driven part? What should they be thinking about? Excellent question. Uh, so what's different about FAST and hence how you should be thinking about FAST in general compared to broadcast is that one, it gives you tons of data. 
And two, it allows you to do a lot more A-B testing. Don't think of channel in a traditional way. Now suddenly you can actually put stuff out there, try it with you know, 10 different variants with different people and see what works and what doesn't work and have that real time uh, control and fine tuning of your channel to get the best possible user experience. Two, a number of our customers are also using FAST for them to promote their own app or their broadcast. So this can be a great top of the funnel uh, lead generation tool for you, if you will, for your premium subscription S4 offering. And there are customers of ours that do live look-ins, for example, into a live game that you're running behind a paywall, but you have this short, you know, one minute preview or shoulder programming that's running in parallel that can actually, you know, uh, potentially attract newer audience that otherwise will not subscribe to your uh, channel or to your S4 offering. And four, on the advertising side, again, everything from targeted sponsorships, personally targeted sponsorships, you know, very contextually targeted, you know, L-bands, lower thirds to advertising that you can actually do, to fairly traditional linear type advertising that you can do on fast. All of that is possible. Again, it's the new world meeting the old world and get the best of both. Okay, I'm excited to do it. How hard is it for me to get into this? There are, there are customers of ours that have actually come in completely fresh and never been in broadcast, uh, never been in linear TV, have come in and actually launched a channel in six to eight weeks. Uh, similarly, there are broadcast customers, there are customers that are public, like Cox Media, for example, that have launched, I think, 30 channels, all local news channels, again, completely targeted on fast, pretty much in a eight, eight to 12 week time frame. These are all live news. They, have, they run about 2,000 live events per day. So you can get fairly complex workflows, uh, new sports workflows, and actually launch channels in a matter of weeks. And as a company, we help them with everything from scheduling tools to play out to distribution to ad monetization as the fastest would be. So pretty much end to end. So not that difficult. And do the ad services integrate with classic planning and buying tools in a way that is easy for traditional broadcasters? Absolutely. So it, it integrates with, but from a programmatic perspective, it integrates with all the SSPs, DSPs, so you can actually work on a standardized, you know, vast based model. And on your ad sales sites, it integrates with your traditional ad trafficking, uh, uh, you know, ad campaign management tools for you to be able to sell one common unified ad unit for your advertisers, whether it's digital or linear. This seems more than a trend. It's like, this is just happening and everyone's getting there. What's next? So we, from our perspective, we are showcasing what is called as fast 2.0. This we think is the first generation of fast. You know, it's just this taking the traditional channel, you know, delivering it over open internet, if you will. Now, can we actually make this much more interesting? How do I actually bring, uh, you know, whether it's personalized EPG lineups, so we can actually change the preference of what channels do I see? You know, now I go to a fast platform, I see 300 channels. Now that's going to go to 1,000. You're going to have the same discovery problem. How do you actually make this much more interesting so you can actually see the right 200 that you want? How do I create favorites? How do I create a profile? How do I even change the channel based on what I watched? How do I actually merge my VOD experience with my linear experience so that I can go seamlessly? I like the show. I come in halfway through the show. I want to watch the next episode. I don't want to just sit there and wait. right? So how do I actually make that experience much, much better? How do we actually collect data? Now you're getting hundreds and millions of data points from all of these consumers. How do you actually collect that to make it meaningful for the broadcaster or the fast channel provider to make decisions in real time? How do you make these live experiences with fan engagement much more interesting and attractive? How do you actually blend your SWOT with fast? So a ton of tons of new innovations happening on that, Shelley. As far as we've come, that's as far as we have to go. Srini, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, Shelley.